Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Paula Rausch, a serving member of our Executive Committee for the Science Advisory Board. Thank you. It's wonderful to see all of you tonight and to be at my 12th one of these meetings. This is a, a special night. Let me add my happy birthday, MSEC, to all the other happy birthdays. Some of you know me from the science board and from the work I do with parents to help them support the resilience of their children. So you know that nothing matters to me more than parents, children, and families. And I especially have the highest regard and enthusiasm for the kind of training that we can do with parents and for parents so that they can be the kind of loving parents and support the resilience of their children. So I'm, um, in part, that is one of the things that I love. Another thing that I love is anything that's pragmatic. And then a third thing is, is food. So <laughs> all three of those things together and the fact that our next speaker is a dear friend of mine, we have been friends for 35 years, colleagues at the Mass General. She's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. She is the director of our Mass General Hospital Couples and Family Therapy Program. And she is going to give you a wonderful talk about family dinners tonight. My only regret is that unlike me, you will not get to also sit at her dinner table because she is an amazing cook my dear friend, Anne Fischel. Thank you so much, dear friend. That was a lovely introduction. I so appreciate it. Um, and thank you also to um, Dr. Mary Keller and her whole um, MSEC team uh, for making it possible for me to be here. It is such, such an honor uh, to be speaking to you tonight. And who knew I would be crashing a birthday party <laughs> at the same time? So that's just a, a bonus. Um, let me just get oriented here in order to forward the slides. I'm, hmm. Is there a? Oh, I'm just going to say next slide. OK, that's fine. <laughs> All right, I'll just, I'll just call it out. Um, so as Paula said, I'm going to be talking tonight about a subject that matters deeply to me, uh, which is the importance of family dinners. And I'm going to talk about why I think they're so great and how we can help families get the most out of them. I'm going to say, too, and only half jokingly, that I think I could be out of business as a family therapist if more families had regular family dinners. And to kind of make that point, I want to take you to a, a moment in my professional life when I had an epiphany about this. I was, um, I, I see families in a home office which sits below my kitchen in the base, I sit, I, my office is in the basement. And I was meeting with a father and son who were just having the most awkward time with one another. They weren't speaking, they were angry with one another, there were long silences in this therapy. And just before I had popped a roast chicken in the oven and I had come downstairs and about halfway into the hour, we all started to smell the lemony garlic chickenness. Um, and the son turned to me and he said, could we stay for dinner? And I thought, oh no, you can't, that's not allowed. Therapists can't have their clients stay and have dinner with their families. And then I realized, gosh, they're not even gonna have dinner, they're probably gonna go to a fast food place at best. And at that moment, I wanted to stop and say, you know what, here's a cookbook. Just take it, leave, go home, cook together, and, and don't come back. You would be so much better. <laughs> just 
eating and, and enjoying that, but I didn't do that. And I have to say, next slide, that the, uh, the research really backs me up. 20 years of dozens of studies show that family dinners are great for the body, the brain, and the spirit or the mental health of family members. Next slide. In terms of the brain, there's a study, a long-term study at Harvard, a literacy study, that shows that kids, young kids who absorb the dinner conversation learn more new words around the table than they do even from uh, being read to at night. You know, I imagine saying to young kids, as I once did to my own children, I was so absent-minded today, I slipped and fell, I think I bruised my kneecap, and I was just lying on the ground, and I was choking back tears, and the mail clerk came, and he came, and he, he picked me up, and I know he wanted to console me, and he reached into his mail bag, and he handed me a dog biscuit. <laughs> um, so, you know, in that moment, in that little story, my children learned six new words. And in fact, there are 10 times as many words that kids learn around dinner conversation compared to in picture books. And um, it's also true that regular family dinners are associated with high rates of achievement. And it's a bigger predictor even than kids doing their homework or doing sports or arts. And when I say regular family dinners, researchers look to five meals or more a week, which could be breakfast or lunch or dinner. Um, next slide. In terms of the health benefits, um, meals, regular family dinners are associated with eating more fruits and vegetables and less fat and salt and sugar than when kids don't. Um, it's also associated with lower, uh, better cardiovascular health in teenagers, reduced asthma symptoms, less um, obesity, and it continues to pay dividends so that kids who grew up having regular family dinners continue to eat in a healthier manner um, even when they're young adults living on their own. And the next slide. And the icing on the cake, so to speak, um, is all the mental health benefits. So regular family dinners are associated with uh, less violence, substance abuse, tobacco use, uh, fewer behavioral problems in school, uh, less depression and anxiety, less uh, teenage pregnancy and eating disorders, and on the converse, it's associated with kids feeling more connected to their parents, higher sense of resilience and self-esteem. So, next slide. Um, so it's no wonder that I had that impulse to send that family home. But you might be wondering why. Why would family dinners have all this power? Um, and I, I want to say that it's really not about the food. You, you don't need to make three-course meals or use heirloom tomatoes or anything like that. Um, the, the power of it really comes when what the food brings the family to the table, but it's what happens once they're there. The power of family dinner really comes from the atmosphere at the table. Is it warm and welcoming? Um, do kids look forward to it? Is there a chance for everybody to speak? Do, do people laugh around the table? This is what really makes the difference. And beyond that, I think the nutritional benefits are partly because when we eat, um, with people, we talk and we don't eat so, uh, well, we eat more mindfully. And we sometimes our brains can um, get the cues from our stomach that we're full, and so maybe we don't eat quite as much. Um, maybe more importantly, and this is the next slide, um, it's a time in 21st century America, I think it's one of the few times that we can connect as a family. You know, we don't, we don't farm anymore together, most of us. We don't make quilts on the front porch. But dinner is a reliable time of the day when families can come together and check in with each other. Parents can catch problems before they get too big. And I think when kids feel connected to their parents, it's like a seatbelt on the potholed road of childhood and adolescence. Going to the next slide. Um, 
it's also, the next slide please, it's also a ritual. So a ritual is when you have a repeated set of actions that you do at a particular time and a particular space, say 6.30 p.m. around the kitchen table. And certain things are the same night after night. You know, most of us sit in the same seats around the dinner table. Um, but what changes is what we talk about and what the food is. And it, it provides some continuity and it provides a boundary um, to separate us from the hubbub of everyday life. Um, and I think that for families who move a lot, as military families do, that rituals have an extra um, power to them because they offer some continuity and reliability. And I think rituals, when families move a lot, often rituals um, have to convey that sense of change and consistency, that when a parent is deployed, maybe the food served is a little simpler because there's only one parent to do the cooking and the cleanup or maybe there's some Skyping with the uh, parent overseas, or as Sarah Smiley uh, wrote about in her fabulous book, Dinner with the Smileys, she had a guest come once a week to sit in her um, husband's seat uh, as a kind of um, something different, but also a way of, of remembering uh, the family. So, uh, the importance of ritual, I think, is also gives a lot of power to family dinner. Um, and the next slide, please. Another thing that happens at the family dinner that really doesn't happen too many other places is storytelling. Um, it's not like we sit around the, the campfire, we write long letters telling stories about our neighbors and our families. But at the dinner table is a chance to tell stories. And there is research that suggests that kids who know their family stories are more resilient and have higher self-esteem than kids who don't. Um, and there are certain kinds of stories that are particularly powerful. I call these lemonade from lemon stories. These are stories where there's been adversity and the then the family member has learned something, has gotten some wisdom, or has been helped by a kind person. And those kinds of stories really pack the most punch, I think, for kids and for adults. And the reason I think that these sto knowing stories about your family is so important is that it helps kids feel that they're connected to something bigger than themselves. And they also hear about the competent adults in their lives and understand that they're, they're, these adults weren't always so competent, that they also made mistakes and had slings and arrows and, and had difficulties. And I think the family stories also let kids know that there are lots of different paths to follow in life. Um, it's not just the parents who uh, we know stories about, but also our uncles and aunts and grandparents. And so there's a much fuller um, world to choose from as kids go forward. Um, next slide, please. So what kinds of stories might you tell? I think when kids are young and they're so egocentric, they like to hear stories about themselves when they were little, or they might like to hear stories about when you were the same age, when you were four and got lost in the depart department store or got stung by a bee, um, or they like to hear stories about animals because like them, animals are small and dependent creatures but there are stories about love stories in your families and um, stories about moving to a new country or a new neighborhood, a new city, um, stories about holidays and celebrations. Next slide. Even stories about recipes of, uh, of food that you're having that night. This is a cake, an ice cream cake that my mother used to make. She was an artist and she didn't like to cook very much, but she loved family dinner. And she loved to make this cake because it was so quick. She could make it in 10 minutes, and it's, it's very beautiful and elegant. Um, and so I like to make it and, and tell stories about her. Um, next slide, please. So I, I want to just take a little aside and reassure you about what I'm talking about and not talking about when it comes to family dinner. 
I don't want you to think that this is a nostalgia uh, journey where I'm talking about a 1950s version. Uh, leave it to Beaver with a mother in the kitchen, spotless kitchen. Um, you know, that boat really has sailed. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. So, you know, most families have, uh, have dual earners and they're just, there's nobody home to make a slow pot roast all day. Um, so I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Um, sometimes families will say, it, does it count as a family dinner if only one parent is home? Of course that counts. Whenever there are two people sitting down together and eating and talking, that's a family dinner. Um, other families will say, does it count if we always get takeout or we make shortcuts, the food's not from scratch? Yes, of course that's a family dinner if people are gathered and talking. There may not be as many nutritional benefits because there's more <laughs> salt and fat and sugar, but of course that counts. Um, is it okay to have the TV on? I, I hear that question. And to that I would say there's research that suggests that um, kids eat more and are more likely to gain weight if the TV is on. And um, there's not as much chance to talk if the TV is on. Um, so maybe, maybe not, that would still be a family dinner, but maybe not quite as terrific as if the TV was off. Um, I had a father say to me recently, when I grew up, we were told we couldn't talk and eat at the same time. What do you think about that? And I said, well, what do you think about that? And he said, I think I can talk and eat. And I, think, I said, I think you can too, and I'm sure your kids can too. And I think they'll get a lot more out of it if they can talk. Um, and then there's that research, that five times a week that sort of hangs heavy on a lot of families. What if you can only have dinner once a week? That's great. Start with where you are, and maybe if it's a great dinner, the kids and the family will want to have dinner more than that. Um, so uh, no tyranny from the, from the researchers. Um, so uh, as I said, I, I didn't... Um, I didn't hand that cookbook to the family, um, but I was, I'm cognizant that family dinner is a simple idea, but it's not an easy idea. Uh, we're all very, very busy. Some of us are working more than one job. Um, our kids are very scheduled. And so I started to think about some ways I could be helpful to families. Um, so I, I wrote a book called Home for Dinner, which has got recipes and lots of tips about how to get more out of family dinners. And I co-founded the Family Dinner Project, which is an organization, a nonprofit, devoted to helping families um, unlock these benefits. And it champions the way that food, fun, and conversation about things that matter can bring uh, families together. We have a lot of online resources. Um, I think the next slide or no, the, the video in just a second, I'm sorry. Um, we have a lot of online resources that are free, a newsletter that you could get once a week, once a month, or little um, cards, that um, uh, a recipe and a game and a conversation that you could get uh, every day of the week. Um, and then we also do community dinners where we bring together a bunch of families, we go to clinics and schools and Ys and homeless shelters, libraries, firehouses, um, army bases, and we bring families together and we cook a meal together, we eat, we play games, we have conversation, and then we get the parents talking about their common obstacles and how to overcome them. And I have a short clip uh, from the Hanscom Air Base, uh, um, military base in Massachusetts, where we did a community dinner. So I'd like to share that with you right now. What is it about food? Everybody loves food. Food breaks down barriers. The Family Dinner Project is about food, fun, and conversation about things that matter. We know from years of research that 
Family dinners make such a difference in the academic, social, and emotional health of families. And so that's the why of family dinners, and the family dinner project is the how. We are at Anderson Air Force Base, and we're going to be putting on a community dinner event. It's all the key elements of family dinner. We cook together, so tonight we're going to make tzatziki. The kids will probably try some things they've never tried before, and then we'll have dinner together. And then at some point during the night, the parents will work with a facilitator and talk about their dinner challenges. I try to get the parents talking about the resources that are in the room. Parents really are experts already on how to have family dinners. And so I ask them first, what are your strengths? What are you already doing well? And then I ask them, what are your challenges? What we've discovered is the challenges are pretty much the same. And the kids are gonna go off and make dessert. And um, just a tip, if you're gonna make whipped cream, it's important to have containers that seal, because it gets really messy <laughs> shipped. <laughs> and then the parents will hopefully leave inspired to work a little bit more on their family dinners. It was great just to get some new ideas, some tips, and to make it more fun for the kids. They're excited to eat something that they make. Technology has changed a little bit. Sometimes that interferes. I wish that we enjoyed it more, maybe had more conversation. Every once in a while, like, kids will say something that seems to come out of nowhere. That's, I guess, what keeps family dinner interesting. Because if it was the same every night, it would be boring and it wouldn't be any fun. For us, if we're helping more families to come together and have better and more fun meals together, we're successful. <laughs>
And we said, sure. And so uh, it turns out when you press the snooze alarm, it's seven minutes. So we said, we'll make a project that you can do in seven minutes at breakfast. Um, so that's on the website as well. Um, OK, next slide. Picky eaters. Uh, so there can be so many reasons that um, kids are picky or selective, or adults are as well. Um, the best advice I've ever heard came from a nutritionist who said that parents should decide what food, when, and where, but it's up, the, up to the kids to decide whether and how much. And what's best is to not really talk about it much at dinner, just to provide the food and let the kids eat. That's easier said than done. Um, it's, the research suggests <clears throat> that it's really best not to cajole or bribe or persuade kids to eat. That in fact, when you say to kids, eat your string beans and then you can have ice cream, it creates a double whammy where the ice cream becomes more attractive and the string beans become less so. Better is to eat with gusto and model your enjoyment or to get kids to be stakeholders, get them to pick foods out of the supermarket with you, or stir the soup, or set the table, or help clean up. Anything that gets them involved will make them more likely to want to eat. Um, it's also true that when kids touch food, smearing oil on vegetables, that may make them more apt to want to try a new food. Um, pediatricians tell me to cut down, to tell kids to cut down on snacking so they come to dinner hungry and ready to eat. Um, or make one meal that can be customized. Um, I, in, you'll see in two slides uh, a chicken soup, a rice soup that I made um, that you can put all kinds of different things. Individuals can make it into their own by their own tastes. But the cook only has to make one meal. Could I have the next slide, please? Sometimes, however, picky eating is more about individual self-expression than it is about anything else, as in this cartoon. I started my vegetarianism for health reasons. Then it became a moral choice. And now it's just to annoy people. Uh, <laughs> so next slide is the Cambodian rice soup. And the next slide is the third um, common obstacle, which is tension and conflict at the table. Um, and food is often a main source of that. So I suggest to families that they get everybody together and make up a list of meals that, that everybody will be happy to see come to the table. No one will bellyache about. Um, so that's the first thing. Go easy on teaching manners. Stick to the manners that really help um, bring respect and help with listening. Um, like not interrupting each other or not speaking with your mouth full. Those would be, I think, important manners for uh, improving the atmosphere. Avoid topics that lead to conflict, like talking about a messy room or a bad grade. Save that till everybody's got a full stomach and maybe you meet one-on-one -on -one with the offender. Um, <laughs> limit technology at the table because um, when you're distracted and talking to people who aren't there, it doesn't make the people who are at the table feel very important and welcome. Um, I did a survey a few years ago and found that parents were twice as likely to use their gadgets at the table. Um, and so I think parents really have to lead the way here and put their phones in a, a basket maybe in the middle of the table. Um, OK, next slide. Um, the last common obstacle I hear is parents saying, my kids love to eat with us when, we were, when they were little, but I, they don't want to eat with us as teenagers. Well, the research really flies in the face of this. When kids are asked, 80% um, say they would rather have dinner with their parents than with their friends or peer, with their peers or by themselves. They also say that dinner is the most likely time of the day that, that they have to speak with their parents. Um, and they list it pretty high up on favorite activities. And I guess most importantly, teenagers have the most to gain from regular family dinners because 
regular family dinners are associated with cutting down on all those low risk, uh, those high risk behaviors that um, we worry about with teenagers like substance abuse and tobacco use and so on. Okay, next slide, please. Um, as a family therapist, I'm very interested in reducing conflict and helping families talk about difficult topics. But if that's all I did, I don't think I would be very effective because I also want to help families enjoy each other, have fun with each other, get to know each other. And I think that food, making food and eating food is such an important um, medium for families. We're, we live in such virtual worlds right now that food is one of the few things that are tangible, that we can smell, that we can manipulate with our hands, and that we can make together. Um, and food with its textures and its colors, its slippery oils and its uh, the, the bread and all of that, but each property of food, the color, the texture, the shape, the size, can be a source of play. And even it can be a source of scientific experimentation where a child can learn by keeping something in the oven for 10 minutes longer, that alters the chemistry. Um, so I have several ways I like to think about play. Next slide. You can play with collage. We do this at community dinners where we set out the salad trimmings and say, take whatever you want, make it into a face or a house or a car. You just have to eat your creation. Um, or the next slide, play with, next slide please, um, play with shape, um, making dough into letters or animals, next slide please, play with smell, close your eyes and see if you can guess what the smell is in a jar, ketchup or lemon or uh, basil, next slide, play with space, Sit in a seat that you don't usually sit, or sit, um, sit outside, or sit on the floor, or sit in a room you don't usually have dinner. Next slide. Play with science. I've seen kids spend hours pickling things, strawberries, avocados, ice cream even, um, and seeing what happens with more time, more acid. Um, so that's another kind of play. OK, next slide. Another way to think about play is with games. And games really help um, with conversation at the table. It can be hard for kids to just sit still and have chit chat. But if you have play games, it, will, it can increase the amount of time they can spend with you. Um, one game that young kids love is would you rather? Would you rather eat worms or eat ants? Would you rather be able to fly or be invisible? Once you start this with kids, they will generate their own would-you-rathers. <laughs> um, two truths and a lie. This is um, the game that's on your card. Uh, you tell two things that are true about your day and one that you made up, and people have to guess. Um, I spent all of last night dreaming about my, my deceased father, who was a proud World War II veteran. Um, and I know he would have loved to have heard all about tonight's events. I um, flew down with a, uh, and the senator from my state was on the plane and I lost my glasses today. I didn't fly with the senator, but the other two <laughs> were true. Uh, um, another game I, I love to play at a dinner table is 20 questions around a family mem memory where one person thinks of a memory and everybody else asks yes or no questions to try to guess what it is. Did it happen on a vacation? Were people crying? Was food involved? Um, and then eventually somebody will guess and it will be their turn. And what I love about this game is that one can collect uh, kind of an album of memories and parents can find out what's top of mind for kids, what kind of memories are they holding on to? And parents can help shape the memories that they find important and want their kids to, to remember. So I like that. And one last game I came up with um, out of desperation two Thanksgivings ago. 
I was anticipating a very tense Thanksgiving. I'm not exactly sure why. It might have been had to do with a political situation or people in my family, some only see each other once a year. And I wanted to come up with a game that would be kind of an icebreaker. And so I left a hat at the door with little post-its and I asked them to answer a question anonymously on the post-it. And I've done this now a few years. One question was, what was your favorite toy growing up? Um, or what book rocked your world? Or what character in a children's book did you most identify with as a child? Or who would you wish were joining us for Thanksgiving dinner? And then during the dinner, I pulled out the answers, and people had to guess which answer went with which person, and then that person could elaborate or not. And it, it made for a very fun uh, couple of minutes. So I was, <laughs> I was grateful for that. Uh, um, there are many more games in my book and, and on the website. Um, so next, uh, next slide. Um, in addition to games, uh, you want to promote nice, you know, interesting conversation. Um, and certainly asking children night after night, how was your day, gets to be tedious when they say, fine. Um, it's tedious for the parent to hear that. Um, and so we've thought a lot um, about how to liven things up. Maybe ask each person to say a rose, a thorn, and a bud about their day. A rose would be something positive or funny that happened during the day. A thorn would be something difficult or challenging. And a bud is something you hope will happen tomorrow. Um, at the community dinners, we have these jars. And they're slips of paper with different kind of funny questions, funny and thought-provoking questions that um, often they people at the families bring them home and put them on their kitchen table. And when the conversation uh, quiets, somebody might pick out a, um, a conversation starter. What's something, what are two things that happened that made you grateful today? What's your favorite season? Um, what character in a movie would you like to be friends with? Um, and there are hundreds of these, again, on the website that one could just cut up and put into a jar. Um, I found with my own kids that if I told a story first, it was more likely they would tell a story back. And that if I kept a map in my head of what their day was like, this works well with my husband too. Um, you know, if I can say specifically, I know you had a meeting today, how did that go? It, it leads to more conversation than if I just offhandedly say, how was your day? So um, next slide. Uh, that's the conversation jar, some other examples of conversation starters. Um, and I think the next slide is my last slide. Um, food is a metaphor for love, again. It always works for me. Um, and in conclusion, um, I want to... Sorry. Uh, in conclusion... Um, I hope I'm leaving you with a few ideas tonight uh, for your dinners or dinners that you might encourage uh, other people to have. On your tables or on your chairs, I guess, was a card from the Family Dinner Project with a game on one side and several um, questions about how to re relieve stress or how you deal with stress. You might want to play or talk about that tonight at dinner. You might want to take it home to your families, or you might use it with families that you work with um, professionally. I want to leave you with one final thought, um, and that is that I think there are few things that we can do for our families that do as much for their bodies, their brains, and their spirits as family dinner can do. So. I urge you and your families and the people you know to cook together, eat together, talk together, and have fun. And I now am standing in the way of your family dinner, your dinner with each other. So I'm going to stop uh, with a big thank you for being such a nice audience.